All right, welcome to the School of Orisha Studies, the Orisha Lifestyle Academy. Many blessings to you and your loved ones. Um, I hope that all is fantastic with you as we go into this change of season and uh, we leave the, the last days of, of summer and start to uh, get into the fall, the autumn. Uh, as, a, as a California native myself, uh, this is this is a, a, a major uh, <laughs> adjustment. <laughs> we have one season in California. <laughs> uh, so this is nice though. I'm, I'm enjoying it so far. Um, but more importantly than the change of season, you know, uh, what I want to share with you today is uh, some insights into the great things that are happening in the School of Orisha Studies. Um, one of the things that I remember as I, you know, coming into the, the, the practice of Orisha Studies was an early experience I had um, when my Oluo came to Oakland and uh, he was going to do some work with one of uh, the elder statesmen of the community. And um, this is uh, someone who's been a part of the you know African liberation struggle for many years. He's a university professor, he's very well known, an author, you know these kinds of things. So I have been familiar with his work uh, um, loosely because you know he's, he's senior to myself. But in the process of, of serving him, um, you know, we went to his house, and I was the the grunt, right, and carrying this and doing that and just making it so that my Olu didn't have to do too much heavy lifting, right? So about maybe two, two three hours into uh, the work that we were doing, the elder looked at me and he said, are you a priest? And I said, well, I am, a, I am an initiate, my body, yes. He said, good, I'm glad to know that. You're doing a great job. You're going to be really good. Keep it up. You know, it was just like that. You know what I mean? And like I said, this is an older man, very old. Um, I was going to say very old, but he's an elder, definitely an elder, right? White hair, like elder. <laughs> uh, very sober and, right, you know, reposed in his his uh, demeanor. And um, I just took it and said, thank you, bye bye, and, and kept doing what I was doing. But I think a lot of what he was referring to is the fact that throughout the, the whole time that we were there, uh, I showed deference. OK, I showed deference. I was a grown man at the time. I had a wife. I had children. I had a career. I was a professional. I owned a home like I was a grown up. Right. But I recognized that in the presence of these elder men, um, it was proper for me to show deference at every turn. And it, it, it comes out of my, my lived experience. I come from a, a generation wherein black people were formal, wherein um, you addressed everyone, sir, ma'am, uh, Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, or Mrs. So-and-so, uncle So-and-so, auntie So-and-so. Um, and then later on, Baba so and so, Mama so and so, Ia so and so, right? That's my experience. That's all I I know growing up, and I know that one of the things that has happened as a result of integration is that as more and more of us have grown up in an integrated society, one of the things that we've taken on is this idea of everything is casual. Everything is casual for uh, for our people now, and it's difficult for a lot of us to make the distinction between when something is casual and when something is formal. There's a certain way that you carry yourself in a formal environment. There's certain language you use in a, in a formal environment, right? There's a certain um, way that you even dress in a formal environment, right? And increasingly, our people have lost sight of and appreciation of the distinction between a formal environment and a casual environment, right? And so, um, in some ways, it's 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 um, beneficial because 
the casual attitude has given birth to things like do it yourself right once upon a time there are things that you would never consider doing yourself you would never do them on your own you would never just take the liberty to make certain things right but in a more casual environment or in a more casual culture you can be more comfortable doing things yourself but ifa is not casual orisha lifestyle is not casual it is not informal it is formal from a to z it is formal it is structured right and so the story that i want to share today is sort of a this is a sort of a hybrid story i'm going to use one as the base but th there were several stories that reflected this kind of a realization right and um this is a story that reflects how important it is for us to recognize when something is formal and when something is casual so that we can act accordingly we can get uh we can participate in the environment in the activity in a way that matches what is supposed to be with match the the tone and the intention of that environment so here's the way the, the story goes this she says when i found the school of orisha studies i was looking for guidance okay I had been studying Orisha on my own and realized that without the help of an initiated, properly trained priest, my studies wouldn't go beyond the surface level. Since I've joined the school, I've learned how to prepare offerings, how to venerate uh, spirit in the Yoruba language, and how to properly protect myself spiritually. The thing that has the greatest impact on my life, on my life however, is making a real connection with Ifa through our 16-day divination cycle. This is the Itadogun. Our Oluo, or Bafemi Origunwa, is not only a Babalawo, but also an educator. His ability to, to take a system that is so complex and make it comprehensive is what sets SOS apart. I am forever grateful to have found this school and amazing community. All right. And so um, one of the things that really struck me about this story was that this individual, number one, knew that she was looking for guidance and direction and and looking for guidance and direction in a you know by someone who was qualified to provide a structured format for learning and and development okay um something that's just i'm thinking of right now <laughs> and when i had my first house there was a leak in the in the basement and I decided I was going to fix this leak myself. Okay. And um, it took me no, no, no lie. It took me uh, about three weeks, right? It was, and it was a weekend. Every weekend I would go and do this. It took me about three weeks and no less than 10 trips to Home Depot, right? Because I, I discovered in the process of fix the reason why it was leaking was because there was mud, you know, um, that was flowing into this. Uh, uh, this pipe and the mud was flowing in there because someone had moved the post of the fence and the, and the fence post had broken the pipe and was letting mud uh, seep into where it was supposed to leak out. So I had to go and dig up the post and take out the old post and put in a new post and flush this pipe and all this kind of stuff. But like I said, it took me three weekends. I'm talking about Saturday, Sunday and no less than 10 trips to Home Depot. Why? Because I didn't have all the tools. I didn't have all the materials. I didn't have all the equipment. I didn't know exactly where to start. I was in Home Depot talking to the old heads while I was there. And I'm I'm in line with something and I tell them what I'm doing and they explain to me, I can't do it with this. I'm going to need something else. And then I got to go back. And, you know, so it was it was quite a learning experience. But as soon as I finished, I felt a combination of pride that I had done it, but also more importantly, I felt a real appreciation for what a, a, a laborer does. Why you pay that guy $99 an hour? Because he already has all that stuff. He already knows what materials they are. He already knows what aisle to go down, right? You're, you're paying this person for their expertise and to streamline the process so that you're not spending, you know, 46 hours trying to do what really should take 12. Okay. And so, this is something that's super crucial about the idea of do it yourself, right? Sometimes people take the do it yourself route because they're cheap, 
right? I'm not saying that this is what this individual is saying, but I know a lot of people who spend three, five, seven, ten years combing websites, um, searching Google, joining Facebook groups because because they you don't want to spend. You feel like, oh, I, I saved um, fifty dollars. I saved a hundred dollars. You didn't save a hundred dollars. You didn't spend a hundred dollars. But you did not save a hundred dollars because in the same way it took me three consecutive weekends to fix what should have been able to be done in one day. It's taking you three, five, seven, ten years to learn to establish a practice that you could learn in one year. So you you haven't spent fifty dollars. You've wasted your most valuable asset, which is time. You've wasted time trying to work around and 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 you know what I mean and be I don't know slick or be creative or whatever it is that have people have in their minds give it up focus on what needs to be done find someone who knows how to do it who's willing to show you how to do it pay the person put in the time and learn it in a formalized way streamline your process and go on with your life right but stop dilly-dallying and that's the, that was the first thing that I really appreciated about what she said is that, you know she really wanted to get beyond the surface level right getting beyond the surface level and if you're in if you're living your life in a completely casual way in a totally informal way again it's difficult for you to make the discernment between knowing when you have gone into a formal a level of practice as opposed to you know just making it up as you go along the second thing that um i noticed or that stood out for me was that this individual is aware of exactly what she has learned that makes the distinction between the do-it-yourself model and the formal model see she she talked about preparing offerings praying in yoruba and um creating and practicing spiritual protection right see all of these things have been formally introduced and each step of that process has been explained this is what you do first and this is why this is what you do second and this is why this is what you do third and this is why it's formalized right it isn't the, the do-it-yourself model you you have to make it up as you go along you know you have to make it up as you cannot you 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 have to make it up as you go along it's kind of like cooking cooking from imagination sure you, it can be done it can be done but when you need to come up with a specific meal for a specific purpose for a specific group of people then you don't want to be improvising you want to know exactly what you're doing you want to know exactly where to go to get the materials and you want to know how to present it okay and um the last thing that i that i noticed and i wanted to share about this person's story was that um what she mentioned was that she had an appreciation of the systems approach right which makes a complex religion more accessible so everything we do in the in the school of Orisha studies is part of a system. If you don't have a system, you can't have a practice. Okay, if you don't have a system, you can't have a practice. The system is what informs the practice. Okay, our system is based on itadogun. The system is based on the, the, that biweekly divination. And that is what governs all of the different elements that we're going to incorporate, right? which prayers we're going to recite which offerings we're going to make which observances we're going to keep and we understand how all of those different areas of activity converge into one thing how they support one movement right it's done in a like i i mentioned yesterday everything is consistent right so many people practice for example isheshe they say that they're practicing the the west african tradition which we call isheshe but they're giving Eshu candy and they're giving Eshu toys, right? But you, which is fine. If you practice the Afro-Cuban tradition, that's what they do. But if you practice Isheshe from West Africa, we don't give Eshu candy and we don't give Eshu toys. We don't treat Eshu like a child. That is, that is not at all congruent with our practice, right? Just for example, people who are on the D, DIY train don't they can't make that distinction right to them you know 
for, for a person who's really steeped in D, DIY and committed to, to doing it yourself, you're not going to understand why you can't graft Hinduism and astrology and Afro-Cuban and Christianity and, and just throw them together according to your whims. Now, you can practice all of those different disciplines. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you want to stay DIY, you can weave those together according to, you, you know, whatever whimsy tickles your fancy for that day. But at the moment you want to formalize a practice and you want to know exactly why things go the way they are, then that's where you you come into a system and your system is going to tell you when you need to look to the stars and when you need to look to the ocean and when you need to prepare certain foods and not eat certain things or not wear certain colors. That's all going to be based out of a system. Your practice is informed by the system. And then there are all these different disciplines that you learn that allow you to be flexible so that when it comes time to implement something into your practice, you can do it because you know how to recite, you know how to sing, you know how to give offerings, you know how to prepare medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the way that I'm teaching in the School of Risha Studies is sort of like a martial arts dojo. You come and, and there's there's the basic training where I'm teaching you certain skills. These are defenses. These are attacks. These are these are evasive. These are all the different elements that go in. Now, when are you going to implement those different uh, disciplines? That's going to be based on how the system is uh, uh, feeds you direction naturally and organically in the Ita Dogu every 16 days we're going to get a new forecast these are the skills you need to sharpen right now these are the abilities you need to lean upon right now right but it's all governed by the sacred text it's all governed by the way Ifa is reading and defining the reality for our group from one phase to the next okay so these are the things that make our tradition rich and, and allow us to have what I call a lot of freedom within the framework, right? It, it is formalized. It is structured. But once you have implemented the structure, once you have respected whatever the formality is, then you're free to do all the other things that, that you need to do to attain a higher level of fulfillment and gratification as a person or a devotee or a member of a, of a of a group or a society and so this matters for our people for our community for individuals within our community largely because when things go wrong because they will go wrong when things happen that you didn't expect you had not anticipated and they will having a formalized practice is going to allow you to troubleshoot more easily See, here's the thing that that happens when you when you go do it yourself. When things work, you don't really know what worked and you don't know why it worked because you have these things that are thrown together in a in a hodgepodge kind of a way. Right. But when things likewise, when things don't work, you, you can't identify where did you deviate? Where, what was the discrepancy that left you open? to a certain kind of a problem was it that you were committing a taboo was it that you were uh not asserting a certain kind of a uh, uh, skill or a certain kind of a behavior at the right time right is it that you just totally ignored the advice of the file what is it that that made you susceptible see that your practice when it's formalized and it's scripted in a way that is traditional and is based on a real system it makes it easier for you to identify when things go off because they're going to go off it's, it's, it's you're not going to come into a situation where your life will just be a, a, an endless series of green lights so there's going to be something that will happen and, and you're going to need to figure out hey why did this go off that's where the value of your practice is because you can trace your steps back to specific activities and troubleshoot this is where i went off or hey everything is going well this is what I, I have been doing. This is what I've been practicing and implementing. And that's what's helping uh, or supporting or enabling my ability to achieve what it is that I hope to achieve. Um, another reason why I, I really urge 
our people who are interested in the school who are, are and interested in formalizing your practice of Orisha, uh, Orisha lifestyle is what I was uh, alluding to earlier around our our adoption of informality and our adoption of, of all things casual. When you have a, a problem yourself, let's say, for example, you have a legal problem. Let's say you have a medical problem. When you go to the doctor or you go to the judge or you go to the lawyer, you're going, you're going to whoever is going to help you. You can't be using slang. <laughs> you can't be using creative language. Oh, they got me messed up. You go to the doctor. What, what's wrong? Oh, man, they just got me messed up. What are you talking about? <laughs> you need to be able to articulate. I have a pain on the left side of my body right here on the left. It hurts or my, you know, or. You know, you're you're I, I'm afraid for my life because these people are threatening to assault me and blah, blah, blah. You, you have to be able to articulate what your problem is or what your desire is in a way that the person who's going to help you can actually help you. Right. That is where a formalized, standardized form of communication becomes essential. Right. Think about now if you translate that into making your prayers. Right. Your prayers and doing your rituals and your offerings, your religion is language. Just like English is language, just like Spanish is language, just like Yoruba is language. But we use spoken language to communicate with one another, right? And we speak to our, to our peers and our loved ones in the language that that person understands. Religion is the formalized language through which you communicate with the divine. Religion, making offerings, making prayers, making sacrifices, these are, this is the, that's the grammar of sacred language. It has been cultivated for thousands and thousands of years, right? Sure, you could go and make up your own language and you can have slang that you can speak on your block, but you can only speak to the people on your block who know that language, that slang. But when you want to talk to the broader world or you want to talk to specific people in the broader world, you need to speak a formalized language that is universally understood. That is what your religion represents. OK, so that's what I'm referring to when I say a system. So you need to be able to streamline your communication with your ancestors. You need to be able to streamline your communication with the divinities. You need to be able to streamline your communication with your own internal spirit by following a structured format for worship, devotion, prayer, etc. All right. This is so important for us. This is so important for us because a lot of us, the overwhelming majority of us are either exiting Christianity or have already or never were formally you know introduced to christianity and we're looking for some way to make this communication with our with our divine essence we're trying to we're trying to satisfy that internal urge to be at one with the ancestors and the divinities and the the, the, the force of life itself and we get this idea that because it isn't christianity or it isn't islam it's alternative we look at Orisha as alternative religion. We look at Orisha as as um, uh, as alternative medicine. It's not alternative. It is not alternative. Okay, it's not. It isn't casual. It isn't do whatever you want. It isn't like you go out with how you feel. No, it is its own structure. It has its own format. And if if you really want to get the results with a high level of precision and exactness out of this tradition, then you follow the format that has been practiced and distilled for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Why would you want to do it yourself when there are people who have spent their entire lifetimes mastering the art and are willing to show you how to master the art yourself? Why would you do it yourself? You know, why would you do it yourself? When I was little, I had a, a, a pipe wrench and a uh, butter knife and i fixed everything in in my house with a butter knife and a pipe wrench 
right? <laughs> Ridiculous, <laughs> right? In the 21st century, there's no reason why someone should be fixing a bike and a TV and a radio and anything else that breaks with a butter knife and a pipe wrench, right? It's ridiculous. And I'll tell you, I didn't think it was ridiculous until I got introduced to some formal tools, till I got my hands on an actual toolbox, okay? Now, once I got a toolbox, there's no way on this earth that I would go back to using a butter knife and a pipe wrench to fix things. That, that's, that's madness, right? It's outrageous that that's what I was using as tools. But it's just insanity that once I've been introduced to formal tools, that I would go back to using a pipe wrench and a butter knife, right? That's the the thing that I'm I'm urging my my people to real you know open your eyes and get really clear. This this isn't a do it yourself practice. Put your butter knife in your in your pipe wrench down. Come in and and get yourself enrolled. Get some formal instruction. Pay your money. Do your homework, master the art, streamline, streamline your process and go on about your life. It is that simple. OK, it is that simple. And so I want to urge you to uh, check out the, the offerings that we have going in the School of Research Studies right now. There is a uh, an, um, I don't know. I didn't check the numbers today, but I think we have, have at least 15 more spaces. Right. And those are the spaces that I'm going to keep open. Uh, indefinitely, right? I'm, I'm I'm not certain as to when I'm going to open up more spaces, but once we fill those spaces, we're going to, that's it, right? We're going to let this group coalesce and gel and a cohort, you know what I mean? Let the cohort be developed and, and get to know one another. And then when the time is right, we'll open up some more. But if you're, in, so if you're interested in joining the school, if you want to formalize your study, if you want to go from the pipe wrench and the butter knife to actually getting a, a, a fully stocked toolbox, then visit orishalifestyle.com, join a class, and, you know, let's start getting busy. Uh, I am looking for leaders. I'm looking for people who respect and appreciate their most precious asset, which is time. I'm looking for people who don't want to waste any more time trying to figure it out and make it up as they go along. People who are ready to, to take a straight path, to a, uh, a a specific destination so that they can start doing the work and start living the medicine that will heal their lives and heal the lives that they are destined to serve. If you're one of those people, then visit orishalifestyle.com, uh, get yourself enrolled, and um, let, let, let's start seeing what kind of results you can get from this magnificent, majestic tradition. It's so beautiful and so fulfilling if you do it the right way. Uh, so with that being said, I want to thank you all for your time and your, your attention. And uh, if you've got any questions for me, please feel free to leave them in the uh, in the comment section below. And as time permits, I'll be more than happy to uh, respond to the best of my ability. So until then, many blessings to you and yours. Bye for now. Odabo.